Neither Bethel nor Hillsong meet the biblical definition of a true church. I don't know, did you know that Jesus was born again? Is his view heretical? If it isn't, then there's no such thing as heresy. It's not just a black and white issue. There's an issue, there's a question of moderation and how damaging and how harmful things are. Not every act of divine revelation is equal in authority. Angelic forces, angelic reinforcement. I mean, it's, it's hard to even respond to that, isn't it? It's, it's mind-numbing, it's blasphemous. When the apostles use the word atonement, they do not depict an angry God. It's cryptic. It's watered down. It has nothing to do with the judicial aspect of the Christian gospel. The most important of all doctrines is that the Bible is the word of God. They have different ideas than you do. You don't have to automatically kick them out of the kingdom. It is our joy today to welcome the professor of New Testament at Southern California Seminary and the scholar in residence at Revolve Bible Church in San Juan. I should have asked how to pronounce this before we started. Uh, Capistrano. The, the salmon go. of Capistrano. Yeah. Right. The salmon of Capistrano, right. Someone has seen Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> Well, he is uh, published in scholarly research journals, contributed to and edited a variety of books, and this year published a primer on a biblical literacy. Dr. Corey Marsh, we welcome you to the show. Hey, I'm happy to be here, you guys. And uh, Ken, Jeremy, I appreciate Do Theology Podcasts. It's one that I listen to regularly. So uh, I'm excited to be on, uh, on, uh, on here today with you guys. All right, now settle the debate. Is it primer or primer? <laughs> yeah, that's funny. That's actually a question I get a lot. So, and it is a debate. And it funny? is. Well, we want to debate about everything. Uh, I say primer because uh, I pretend to be an Oxford Don, apparently. <laughs> uh, but uh, more American English readers might say primer. But uh, primer in literary terms is actually when we're talking about a book, an introduction to a subject in literature. Primer is more proper. Uh, but primer works as well. You know, it's just the introductory matter before you get to the to the main thing. Mm -hmm. Well, before we get into the uh, context of the the book and the or the content of the book, rather, a uh, couple of questions just from the bio. It's you're a scholar in residence. Can you just help explain for someone who may have thought, what on earth does that mean? Uh, just what on earth does that mean? Uh, a scholar in residence at a local church. Yeah, it's a unique title, isn't it? Um, you know, I'm very honored by it. It was given to me by the elders at my church, Revol Bible Church in San Juan Capistrano. Good job, Ken. <laughs> you, that, you did that right. Um, you know, it's it's something that we're still working out of exactly how how it looks. But I will tell you this. They had given that title to me um, because they know my passion for bridging the church and the academy. For too long, it seems like the church and the Christian academy have been separated, and we need to wed them together as they once were. Um, and so there's a whole slew of people out there, believe it or not, that are PhD professors, that are scholars, that don't feel they have a right place in their local church. And oftentimes you'll see them be isolated to the extent where they're just in their, you know, their their offices and their their classroom settings and not very uh engaged in the local church community i'm the exact opposite i want i'm a churchman at heart um but i also love christian scholarship i feel god has called me to that so the way it works at our church um i teach classes that are perhaps maybe a little bit more on an academic level but not too much uh, we'll do a New Testament survey, perhaps, or an eschatology series, perhaps, and we'll all come in and we'll also bring some other professors to come in with me. Um, I like to do, they asked me to provide a scholar's update to the elders and to the church every few months. So what's current in biblical studies, because this is my circle. So I'm, when I'm writing and researching and I'm presenting at conferences and academic societies, I'm able to speak on some things that are some hotly debated issues, things that are sort of in vogue right now, maybe some scholarly voices that church would normally not have known about. And I can speak into that. Because what generally happens is it's at the academic level. You know, the scholars write the commentaries, write the uh, write the monographs, write their journal articles. And what happens in time, that ends up trickling down to the pulpit, to the local church level. A pastor will now use resources without even perhaps knowing what transpired before that commentary or whatever that article was written. And it, and it does inform the church. It does come into the local church level at some point. 
but oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes sort of with a sense of ignorance, not knowing all the backstory of, of where these conversations took place, which are generally at the academic level. So um, the Christian scholarship, the academic scholarly works do make their way into the local church, but generally indirectly. I wanted to be a voice where I can represent that world, give it a fair, balanced reading, um, and expose the church to uh, debates and discussions that are happening at the ac academic level that they might not get otherwise. So you're a, a scholar in residence at Revolve Bible Church, and you're a professor at Southern California Seminary, which is, uh, it says in the introduction to your book, that's under the supervision, or however you want to phrase that, of Shadow Mountain Community Church, where Dr. David Jeremiah is the pastor. Could you explain the relationship between Shadow Mountain Community Church and Southern California Seminary for the uninitiated? Sure. Yeah, oftentimes I'll have to drop David Jeremiah's name for people to know who we are because <laughs> uh, we're such a small seminary, but we are actually older than the church that we fall under. Uh, SCS, Southern California Seminary, where I teach, it's in El Cajon, which is the greater San Diego area, East County, San Diego. It's uh, 76 years old, the school is, that is, 1946. Um, so that's 76, I think, mm -hmm. 75 around there. Uh, that makes SCS older than the modern state of Israel, by the way. So we've been there for a while. Um, we are, as far as I know, the oldest fully accredited traditionally dispensational school on the entire West Coast, from San Diego up through uh, uh, Washington, accredited by tracks as well as ATS. Um, and we've been there for, you know, that many decades. Shadow Mountain Community Church, as you mentioned, is pastored by David Jeremiah. And before him, it was Tim LaHaye. Um, and so we have a very strong relationship with the church because as I mentioned earlier, it's a perfect place for me to be because I have such a, a love for the local church. And I believe that the seminaries should be sub submission, uh, submitting to the local church. There needs to be oversight from a local church because we're training pastors and missionaries and, and all of these things. Um, and so the relationship is David Jeremiah is technically our chancellor mm -hmm. of the SES. We have our own president. We have our own property. It's, it's right on the same street. On, on the, if you go down the street, which is Greenfield and Madison's on that corner, on one side is Shadow Mountain Community Church. The other side is SCS up on, on a hill. Um, and it's, been, it's, it's older, as I mentioned. So the church technically inherited the seminary. Um, but we have a very, very close relationship with them. We, we train many of their pastors. We do our graduation ceremonies in the, uh, the worship center at Shadow Mountain. Our banquets are held there. Um, very, very close um, overlap. So it's, 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 a, it's a nice relationship we enjoy where we are independent to, to an extent, but not to the extent of being our own island. We still fall under a leadership of a board of a local church to make sure that uh, we are honoring God through the local church, which is actually part of our mission statement at SES. Very good. Now, you mentioned earlier when you were speaking to the issue of trying to see you know, these, these worlds of, of the scholastics and the, the local church and, and trying to bring those two together, trying to bridge that gap a bit. Because historically, I mean, this is just kind of the way things have worked out. There has been a bit of a gap. And in your viewpoint, that gap is not a healthy gap, right? Like that, that, that shouldn't be there. Um, do you see a connection between the importance of a local church involvement in order to help Bridge that gap. So many of our seminaries are so disconnected from any local churches. They're just kind of existing independently on their own. Can you talk a little bit to the connection between a local church and a seminary that can help with, uh, with bridging that gap a bit? Of course. Now, when you, when you read the New Testament, it's going to say in Ephesians 3.11, that is through the church that the manifold God, the wisdom of God is made known to the rulers and principalities in the air. Um, so there was back in the first century, there was no seminary. Of course, it was when the new Testament was written, there was just the local church and all instruction would come out of the church. Um, this would go all the way up through the medieval eras and even into reformation times. But, you know, I look back on the Puritan days, you know, in the 17th century, I mean, it was the smartest guy in the village. It wasn't just this academic, he was the local pastor and he wasn't smart for his own sake. It was, he was schooled, he was trained. He was training his people to understand the scriptures rightly. And the village and the town would understand that and respect the pastor as being that authority figure, if you will, having done the work, the diligence and the academic rigor, but you know, also uh, maintaining a devotional life. And so with the church, I look at it as we, the church, the seminary, that relationship, you know, we need, 
more shepherd shepherd hearted professors in the classroom you know say you get a class and you have a group of students you might only have them three hours a week every week but within those three hours there's a calling there you are shepherding those students in whatever class you're teaching for them to know the scriptures rightly and to grow closer to god through them and we also need better trained exegetes and scholars behind the pulpit at the church you know, going back to those older days where the local church pastor was really was trusted for having having done the work and the education coming out of the local church. We need those pastors behind the pulpit that are trained um, in ways that the local no, normal everyday church life just does not have the resources or time to be able to devote to the training that a seminary can. I, I recently read a, um, a statistic. I can't remember where it was from, but it was shocking. It might have been from Gordon Conwell Seminary. They have a Center for Global Christianity. It might have been there. I'm not entirely sure. But I did read the statistic that only 5% of the world's Christian pastors are seminary trained. Hmm. Uh, that is remarkable. That means 95% of the people that are preaching God's word every week and doing normal church life of, bibl- of counseling, of, of everything that comes with ministry, discipleship, have not been to seminary. Um, and this is on a global level, mind you. In America, we're very privileged. We have the majority of the world seminaries here. So it seems like every pastor has gone to a seminary, but globally it's not. And we have a lot of, ba- I'll frankly say it, a lot of bad pastors, a lot of weak churches because they simply just don't have the training um, that they need. And the seminary can come alongside the church as it should, not to take over it, but to come alongside because a seminary is a parachurch ministry coming alongside the church to help give those resources to better, to train pastors to better exegete the word, to bring in Greek and Hebrew and and, and just just the, 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 the cutting edge that's happening within scholarship of ideas like, you know, journal articles and monographs that might, um, you know, that'll write an entire treatise on a, a very narrow word or some type of syntax or some theme. These are important for pastors, local pastors to know, to be able to uh, have more of a robust exposition when they're preaching with authority. Um, so, you know, there's some, some basic ideas that are floating in my head as, as you asked me that, Ken. Um, they're just, there needs to be a stronger, I think, a stronger relationship between the church and the seminary, but the order is church first and seminary supports the mm. church. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that order is is critical, uh, and and I won't get off on rabbit trails on that a little bit. Uh, I want us to bring us uh, a little bit back to you now. This this kind of ties in with that issue of wanting to see more people knowing God's word better, so that we can teach God's word better. That really dovetails right into this book that you wrote, a primer on biblical literacy. And I, I'd beautiful like you to, cover, by the way, for those watching on YouTube. I think uh, it's a beautiful looking book. So props to whoever designed that. That was nice. Uh, you know what? I will give full credit to Jonathan Pascarello. We use uh, him often for most of our books at SES Press. He does excellent design. And, you know, I'd give him one idea. I, I want to see a book, mm-hmm. a Bible opened. That's it. Nice. And that's what he came up with. And uh, going back and forth and kind of making it just right. And I appreciate cool. that, Jeremy, because we yeah. do take, uh, we do, do put a lot of effort into our covers to make sure that they, they look, they look nice. Good. Well, how about you just give us a, a, a just a brief definition of what is biblical literacy? This is a primer on biblical literacy. Well, what is that? Yeah. So that's really what I discussed in chapter two. The DNA of the book is what is biblical literacy, right? And I define it by achievable awareness and proficiency. Um, and, and the more I've thought about this and I've taught on this, you know, this is something I might go back and, and expand in the book or, or maybe a second edition, kind of you know, edit it, revise it a little bit. What I want to get across is the idea of a developing process. Okay. It's never we cross that finish line and say, yes, I'm biblically literate and that's it. Everybody is at a different stage of biblical literacy. Um, so everybody can achieve it. The way I define it, it is developing in our awareness of the God of the scriptures by becoming more proficient in scripture's meaning. That is how I define it. And and defining it that way, I'm making a direct connection between God and the Bible. We're going to say the Bible, it does not merely contain the words of God. And it doesn't merely, uh, oh, does (laughs) this is even the right way to put it. It it doesn't turn into the word of God in in moments of crisis of faith such as older neo-Orthodox positions. We're going to say it actually is the Word of God. When you're reading Scripture, you are thinking and you're reading God's thoughts after him, expressed through the human author. So there's a direct connection between God and the Bible. So the way I look at biblical literacy is the greater goal 
say in hermeneutics and reading scripture is not just to know the Bible better, but to grow in our awareness of God of the Bible, to grow closer to him. And the way to do that is to understand scripture's meaning. So develop in our awareness of God through developing in our proficiency of scripture's meaning, both of those together. It was a problem, I mentioned it in the book, um, when doing research for this particular project, biblical literacy is a term that's often assumed but never really defined. Mm. And so it was a problem. I, in fact, I call it the problem of definition in that chapter that it was hard uh, to actually find a work that defines biblical literacy. In fact, I didn't find any. I found some really helpful works that describe it, um, you know, that kind of sort of, you know, maybe dance around the issue, but they're bringing in, you know, um, some overlap with some other concepts, but no one actually gave a crystal clear definition. So I had to sort of go out on a limb with mine by those two, those two key concepts of awareness and proficiency. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's dwell on those for a moment because that was a key element in the book when it came to defining and explaining this thesis of biblical literacy. Could you just spend a, a couple paragraphs on each topic uh, just so it's it's clear in the mind of the listener before the listener becomes a reader of your book, what you mean exactly by awareness and proficiency, how they're different and how they work together? Mm -hmm. When I'm thinking of awareness, I'm thinking of discerning God's presence through his scriptures, not in a mystical uh, sense, not in a, a vision sense, if you will, that he just appears but growing closer to God's presence through reading his word. That would be the awareness part. That when we're reading stories, they're not just mere stories. Whether, whatever the genre is, whether it's historical narrative, like in Genesis or the, or the whole Pentateuch, if you will, or the gospels, you know, these are historical narratives. Some might even call the gospels biography. They're not merely those literary genres and that's it. There is a God behind those words and we are growing closer in our relationship to God through Christ by reading the scriptures. So regardless of the genre, it's, it's trans uh, 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 genre, if you will, whether it's historical narrative, poetry, epistle, prophecy, the goal, the wider goal of reading scripture of hermeneutics, I might be jumping ahead of myself here, but that's chapter three, but the wider goal of hermeneutics is to lead to biblical literacy, which itself, the goal is to grow closer to God's awareness through rightly understanding him. And that's the proficiency part. Now we have to actually roll up our sleeves, do a little work and interpret God's word rightly. So going back to the, the concepts of genres, literary genres, Hebrew poetry like the Psalms or Proverbs or parts of Job and Ecclesiastes will not be read in the exact same way as we would read Paul's epistles. You know, one is didactic and teaching and, you know, prescriptive, if you will. There are commands given for the church to do in the New Testament while others are stories, are descriptive, which we see in both the Old and New Testament, whether it's the book of Acts, which is descriptive, how the church was, was formed and spread and the gospel spread, or in the Old Testament that you see so many stories in the, in the Kings and the Chronicles. We have to understand and interpret these things according to their genre, and that's proficiency. Hmm. Um, the goal of proficiency, though, and this is how we grow in our awareness of God's presence, is to discern the authorial intent of that particular portion of uh, scripture always is what did the author intend? And as you know, in the book, in that same chapter, that's how I define meaning. I'm going to equate meaning with authorial intent when others will say meaning is in the uh, process of author to reader and the reader sort of creates an environment to understand meaning. Uh, or there's meaning in the symbols themselves. It's very textual. The, the text now becomes a separate entity from the author's mind. I'm going to say no. I'm going to say that meaning is, de is defined directly to the mind behind that wrote that text, and we can actually read their thoughts after them by reading and rightly discerning the, the word. So that's all proficiency, and that's really where you're, you're rolling up your sleeves. That's where you're doing word studies. That is where you are. You're going to bring out your concordances, stu uh, study aids to help. Um, not it, It's not crucial. It's not necessary to grow in biblical literacy to have these things, but these tools are available to help us uh, grow closer to God and understanding him and his meaning more. So those are okay. maybe a little crash course on, on what I'm, I'm thinking with both those concepts. On page 50 in the book, you state that it's a popular notion that a Christian should read the Bible as they read any other type of literature. But you go on to say, even though there's truth to that rule, 
and the intention is well-meaning, it's not entirely accurate. So would you say that as a Christian reading the Bible as they would any other type of literature is focusing on proficiency to the detriment of awareness? Uh, is that how that would play out with those definitions? Yeah, I think so, Jeremy. That's pretty. That's that's pretty good. Yeah, I would I would agree with that because Cause, cause you, we have to have an awareness that this is God breathed, and we're moving closer to the God who breathed it. Correct. Hebrews four twelve. Um, you know that the, the the scriptures are living and active, can pierce between soul and spirit. Second um, Timothy three sixteen. That yeah. all scripture is theopneustos, is God breathed. This makes this literature radically different than everywhere else. And for one major reason, probably for what you just said, Jeremy, is that it's this literature that grows us closer to God because it's directly his thoughts expressed in the words, which makes it different than reading any other book. So there is some truth to, yes, we read scripture like we would read other literature, meaning we recognize genre difference and we're going inter to interpret according to genre. You know, I, I have an example in, in the book. No one confuses Johnny Cash's Folsom Prison Blues, which is a song lyric, uh, with, um, you know, with, with medical records or tax documents. We understand these things intuitively. Um, so can someone who does not have the Holy Spirit in them and not understand this is God's word rightly understand Scripture? Yes, to a point. But where the difference is, you got to the, the Scriptures are made to go closer to God and to submit to that word. And that is where it's, uh, it's only possible with a regenerate Holy Spirit indwelled believer. Mm -hmm. And so this is going to make the Bible totally different than every other literature the world has ever produced. The Bible is its own category. And, and one more thought on that, just this idea that when we call the Bible, which, which the Bible, we call it the Bible, right? Biblos in Greek, it's a book. That's sort of misleading because we tend to think it's just one story or one book when the Bible's really a library of 66 different books, different genres. And oftentimes the newer Christian or the, the very rusty Christian Bible reader does not respect or understand the fact that these are different genres written over hundreds and even thousands of years of time um, and that we need to respect that and that gets back to the authorial intent what was the intent of this particular book is it being written who was the audience um what is what are the main themes all of that comes out of the proficiency aspect of, of biblical literacy so yes the bible is different it's same where we interpret where we understand according to genres like we would other literature but it's radically different this is special revelation it's god's words the only book in the world that can claim that it seems like there's a tendency, especially in circles like ours, to put a premium on proficiency, uh, perhaps to the total ignorance of awareness. Um, awareness can be much harder to measure, to quantify, to perceive among other people, whereas proficiency, you can give somebody a test. I mean, you think of Bible college and seminaries have these entrance exams where they test your your knowledge of the Bible, and then on the way out, you can take the same test and see how much you've grown in essentially your proficiency, yet that says nothing to your awareness. So you could have lost ground in your awareness. Do you think there's a danger in the way that we typically go about evaluating our growth as Christians and our relationship to the Bible? It's a good question. How do you quantify someone's spirituality between them and the Lord? At the, at the end of the day, it's, it's very personalized. You know, it's between them and God. Yeah. You can give principles of how to read scripture. At the end of the day, it has got to be that spirit dwelt believer submitting to what he's reading to grow closer to God. And there's just, as a professor at seminary, we have all our courses are designed to have that spiritual aspect, but at the end of the day, there's no way to quantify that as opposed to quantifying Bible knowledge. Like you said, that's very, that's the only, that's what we're reduced to. So this is where the relationship with the local church comes into play. And so like, for example, I can speak as a professor, we'll have many courses that are ministry internship oriented, uh, field tested where you have to be serving in a church and these things you're held accountable uh, to your, your local elders and, and whoever, and your over, overseers or leaders in the church that may help quantify, to use that word, that spiritual aspect of side of, of that side, but it is much difficult. And that really does speak to the crucial relationship between the local church and the seminary that both need to be lockstep in what we're doing here. Because as you mentioned, I will tell you this, as, as, as a professor, as someone who is a, 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 a somewhat of a, a scholar in, in publishing and in part of academic societies and those types of things, some of the most illuminating, insightful 
ideas of scripture that I've read are written by people that have never stepped foot in a local church. You know, we can read something and just assume that knowledge equates spirituality, a thriving relationship with God, and come to find out it doesn't. Some of the most respected scholars, in fact, don't have any connection to local church. They are isolated in their ivory towers, if you will, to use that crass term, which again speaks, I can't go, I can't, you know, underscore that enough, the relationship between local church and academy, both together. Um, because that spiritual side needs to be quantified in some aspect. And the only way to do it, other than between the person and the Lord, is to have a body of believers that are that are discipling one another, keeping each other accountable. Um, and, and I do mention that in the book, the yeah. crucial X factor of fellowship, right? That is. That, that I was going to mention that, that you talk about the need for community. God didn't design us to study a book in a vacuum. That's right. That's right. When you look at the New Testament, look at the Gospels, perhaps, you know, for to start there with Jesus and the, and the disciples. I can't think of an instance where there's one disciple by themselves with Jesus. You know, they're, they're always in, a, they're, a pair, they're in groups of 12 or they're in pairs or triads. Uh, perhaps maybe the only example I, that, that might qualify is the end of the Gospel of John, where P Jesus is restoring Peter to ministry. And then he goes and predicts G, uh, Peter's, you know, impending death. When you're old, you're going to be stretched out and go somewhere we don't want to go, which was a prophecy of Peter's execution. Um, that might qualify as the one place, perhaps, where there's a disciple alone with Jesus. But I don't even think that one really does because Peter immediately turns back and goes, what about this guy? Talking to the beloved disciple, which is John the Apostle. So even John's an earshot of that conversation. He must be very close. So with that possible exception, uh, exception aside, there's just not disciple. There's not these extended scenes where Jesus is walking alone with a disciple. And from that, we can infer we need each other. You know, the disciples needed them to, to be a group under Christ. We as a local church, we there's no such thing as an isolated Lone Ranger Christian. We are grouped together. And, and that is what I call in the book, the crucial X factor. It's not discussed in these areas a lot of times with hermeneutics and biblical literacy the importance of being with other believers. It's just the very, you know, the 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 basics of one-on-one of -on -one discipleship and group discipleship, whether it's in small groups, my church, we call them life groups, or under the exposition of scripture every Sunday. This is a critical tool that God has given us to understand his word, and that is the local fellowship of a local church. Yeah, so the uh, the issue, obviously we're talking about something more here than just Hey, everybody, read your Bibles, right? Like this is this is really a bigger thing than that. And there have been a variety of studies. You cite different studies within the book. Uh, this morning, I was just doing a Google search to see if there were any uh, any anything that other people had written on this issue as far as studies and things that have been done about the the growing trend of diminishing literacy, not only in the secular world but even within people who would identify themselves as evangelicals where there's this growing trend of people who just don't have just even the just the most basic knowledge of of who different bible characters were and and uh, basic things of theology that are you know anybody who has read the bible to any extent knows what's there but there's just this growing lack of that knowledge what are the what are the concerns that you can see within maybe perhaps specifically within a local church, if there's a low level of literacy within a local church, but then even, even in society at large, where at one point there was a higher level of literacy just in general society and where that's not. So maybe concerns within the church and then concerns within society at large, if this trend isn't reversed. Man, Ken, that is such an important question because you're, you're highlighting an aspect of American evangelicalism that I will say is just frankly, is very ugly. And it's to the detriment of the church. We have gone outside the Bible, the Bible takes a back seat, and we're now more concerned with elevating platforms of our favorite leaders. Uh, even I'm reading a book right now, in fact, before we even started this interview on just the crisis of Christian celebrityism, um, how we've turned leaders into idols and social media platforms and, and, and podcasts not do theology podcasts, of course, there's the exception <laughs> and one of the exceptions, but all these other things that can go awry that can detract us from old school vintage training and growing in knowledge of God and growing closer to him, which is Bible. I will say this. I, I think we have become too familiar with the scriptures to the problem of biblical illiteracy. 
Ken, that you that you asked, that you pointed out, 91 million Bibles are printed globally every year. Okay, there's no there, there's there's no question it is the most popular book, or as I said earlier, library of books, right? But the most popular literature product in human history is the Bible. Um, I have a stat here that I'm looking at just as we're talking. The average American, Christian or non, the average American is what has, owns at least three Bibles in their house. You know, it's become this sort of maybe familiar good luck charm to have yeah. in your in your house. You know, um, but the illiteracy rate is remarkable. As I say in the book, 12, uh, 81 percent of, of, of Christian survey believe that uh, God helps those who help themselves as a Bible verse. Um, I'm looking at other stats right now. Twenty seven percent of Christians think Superman is a biblical story. <laughs> um 50% of evangelicals believe the Holy Spirit is a force and not a personal being, and that comes out of not reading Scripture, where he's clearly a person, the third member of the Trinity. Yeah, uh, Six, uh, Corey, if I could insert a couple yeah. more stats, because I was pulling some stats up, too, from the State of Theology survey from Ligonier from this year. Right. Um, among evangelicals, so those who identify as evangelicals, there are, let's see, 21, 33% say that the Bible is not literally true um, out of those who identify as evangelicals. Um, those who say that science disproves the Bible out of evangelicals is 32%, so about the same. So about a third say that science disproves the Bible and that it's not literally true, which is a very, very bad starting point. And you know what's so alarming about that, Jeremy, is that these are evangelicals. Now, we've narrowed it. So from Christian, which is a broad term, you know, within Christianity, you have Protestantism, what's labeled under Christianity, Protestantism, Neo-Orthodox, or uh, Eastern Orthodoxy, rather, Roman Catholicism. And then within Protestantism, we get even more narrow to the sub-traditions. Evangelicals, this is one of the reasons why the term is so elastic now. It means everything. It's been eroded. What does it actually mean? It's almost everything under the sun. But historically, evangelicals were people that were tied to, one, the evangel, the gospel, and a high view of the inspiration of Scripture. You know, it's still one of the requirements to be a member of ETS, Evangelical Theological Society, that you believe that the autographs were inspired and inerrant, and you believe God is a trinity. It's been reduced to those two things. But that was what, what we're known for. So if those stats you just said, that would make more sense, you know, if the, we're talking about the broader range Christian out there. But if we're going to say evangelicals don't understand the inspiration of Scripture or um, believe the things that you just said, or don't understand one of them as an evangelical uh, a stat from that Ligonier study that Christ isn't the only way to heaven. Then traditionally they shouldn't be called evangelicals. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the term has been turned has been used for so many things where it's even a political block now for certain votes. You know, the evangelical vote, if you will. Anyways, we need to get back old school, vintage, as I say in the book. And just let Scripture be our ultimate authority, get back to actually training in Scripture, training our people in Scripture, and recapture what evangelicalism was historically, which was always tied around this high view of Scripture. Those stats you just said and the ones that I, that I mentioned in the book should never, ever characterize someone calling themselves an evangelical. Okay, so obviously these are these are very concerning statistics, right? These are things that are just like, oh my goodness, what what's the what is the concern with that? Like boil it down, come into a local church, people, um, you know, that they're coming together. Hey, at least maybe they're believing in Jesus. You know, isn't that good enough? Why why is this such a concerning trend within a local church? Well, I'll go back to something that's a little bit of a rant of mine. People that are around me all the time, they probably get sick of me complaining about this. But unfortunately, Christianity in the West, in North America, and specifically in America, has been industrialized. It has been commercialized. It is now, it is, it is now, it's now a business, whether that's evangelical publishing or CCM, you know, contemporary Christian music, or uh, you name it. Mega, the mega church movement certainly hasn't helped in this aspect. And, I'm, and I don't want to deride all of those things because there's good in there. But when we've what we've done is we've conflated the American ideal, you know, of success and capitalism and coalesced that with what we see in Scripture. So now all of a sudden we're reading Scripture as in an American nationalist type of hermeneutic where we should where prosperity actually makes the most sense if you're doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're not being blessed financially, then you may not be, you know, a, a true Christian or something like that. These ideas get very dark that way. 
But we need to make a distinction, and this goes back to just being becoming biblically literate, to understand that we're reading a book that is ancient, it's Middle Eastern, you know, Christianity is, is different than the other religions where you can pinpoint, say, the birth of Islam and where it still thrives. You can pinpoint the birth, if you will, to an extent of Buddhism and where it still is the place to be, whether it's India or China or something like that. Christianity is not that way. It started in the Middle East and it goes around the globe. Right. This is one of the wonderful, beautiful things about true faith, which is true faith in Christ, true religion, biblical Christianity it can't be pinpointed one way. And the problem is when those locales take their view of Christ of the Bible and Christianity and industrialize it, commercialize it according to their culture, it becomes a business. And in Amer American evangelicals, and we're guilty of that more than anyone, um, we, we look at these things as, as signs of success, as opposed to when you look at Jesus and the humble example that he gave us, how many Christian leaders, evangelical leaders today on a, on a platform are really modeling that. It's hard to tell. So to go back to you know your question, Ken, I, I really look at it as we've industrialized the faith. We've commercialized it. We've become too familiar with this ancient bloody faith um, that brings us closer to God, that God sent his son to die for sins. That is not something to trivialize. We've turned the good news into the old news. You know, we've become too familiar with it. And we've lost that, uh, that incredible just power and intimacy that we have with our Lord by reading his scriptures because we've let our attention just go on to other things that make us successful, whether it's church branding or products, all these things that use a Christian name. We need to give old school and vintage, cut all that out and go back just to the scriptures. Yes. And then and speaking of coming back to the scriptures, the as you have defined it, okay, awareness and proficiency. Now the way to grow through that as as one of your uh, phrases that you like to use is everything boils down to hermeneutics, right? It, it, all, it all comes back to that. Now, hermeneutics, obviously, that's something we get excited about here on the Two Theology Podcast. We've got a whole series on hermeneutics, uh, and, and that's something that we're, again, just passionate about. As you see it, and even as you discuss it within the book, what is the connection between literacy and hermeneutics? Good question. So this is one of the things I wanted to specify in the book, and I, and I hope it's clear, but I don't know if it's clear enough. Hermeneutics, oftentimes we don't see books, at least from this perspective, a conservative evangelical, even, let's say even fundamental perspective, addressing biblical literacy. Oftentimes they're hermeneutics, wonderful hermeneutics textbooks, fine books. And perhaps they think they're addressing biblical literacy, but it's really methods on how to read scripture. I look at hermeneutics, the relationship to your question, Ken, between hermeneutics and biblical literacy. Biblical literacy is the wider goal. It is the greater goal. Hermeneutics helps us to understand scripture, right? To, to understand, apply the art and science of interpreting scripture is what we're meaning by hermeneutics to lead to the greater goal of being biblically literate, which itself has the goal of growing closer to God, right? So biblical literacy is really the end game, if you will, because within that is growing closer to God, his awareness, uh, awareness of his presence in the scriptures. Hermeneutics is the method to get there. So these are two, dis there's overlap, there's a huge relationship, but they are two distinct categories. And so I, I couldn't write a book on biblical literacy without addressing hermeneutics. And it's in the title, it's a primer, as we already discussed, so this is not comprehensive. And at the end of the book, I, I give some of the, my favorite resources that have helped me, whether it's uh, bibliolo bibliology, doctrine of the Bible, or hermeneutics uh, textbooks that the reader can go and I, and I, I, you know, I rank them according to like what's best for elementary to intermediate to advanced. But you can't talk about biblical tree without talking about methods of reading scripture, how to become proficient. So yeah, that is chapter three. I'm a nerd with you guys, hermeneutics all the way. I teach uh, hermeneutics at uh, Southern California Seminary from the basic elementary level all the way to advanced hermeneutical theory and exegesis. And so when we get to hermeneutics, this is key. What do we, how are we going to apply our method? What method are we going to apply to grow in our awareness of God and proficiency? And as you know, what I argue for in that particular chapter is a consistent, literal, grammatical, historical hermeneutic. This is, this is time and tested, true of getting to the author's intended meaning the best way we can, because we don't have the prophets and the apostles. We can actually ask them, what did you mean by this? We have to assume that what they wrote is exactly what they mean. And so our goal on this side uh, all these thousands of years removed in a different culture um, is to reproduce that original intent that was always there, not to come up with our own meaning, but to what did the author himself mean? And so 
I, I give a couple um, uh, um, techniques that I like to employ, whether it's the hermeneutical triad or the hermeneutical spiral, I call it uh, the grammatical historical method. These are all related concepts for us to have a responsible interpretive uh, method when we come to scripture and not just throw the dart on the page and say, okay, whatever this lands on, that's my verse to claim this day and, and I can make the meaning up to whatever I want. Absolutely not. We need to be diligent and uh, make sure we're rightly handling the word of truth. So that chapter really deals with those different techniques I think are very helpful to be able to us, for us to understand the, the original intent. More than being uh, consistent or um, in a tradition, a theological tradition, you actually make the argument in the book that that method of interpretation is ethical. Could you explain what you mean by the, the, that interpretive method being the ethical way to go about reading scripture? Absolutely. I'm glad you brought that up because that's another issue that's not discussed a lot when we talk about hermeneutics. There is an ethics involved. Nobody likes to be taken out of context. It happens all the time in daily speech. You hear uh, on the news someone being quoted, misquoted, and, and it's, it's a personal offense. However, if we take Jesus' golden rule, what's called the golden rule, and draw some inferences, some, some, maybe some, some principles from that to treat others as we would like to be treated— then when we come to reading scripture, we should treat the scriptures as the author of the scripture would like to be treated. And that means we can't just make it mean whatever we want. We actually have to take it as the author intended. There's a single intended meaning. To violate that is to offend the author. Just like if we said something and someone took it out of context and, and created a whole school or community around a misinterpretation, we would take it as a personal affront. Um, how often we don't consider that when we read scripture. Like, are we offending the author who ultimately is the Holy Spirit using these chosen men? Or are we offending them by making it mean whatever we want it to mean? No, we need to get back to the authorial intent, which is the ethical component. Well, um, that is the third chapter and, and final chapter of the book, essentially, is the, the one on hermeneutics, though you do have the... Um, pretty big appendix section where you reprint the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy, and then you offer a list of resources for those who want to take their literacy to the next level. And uh, I think Ken and I both could say that we appreciate that we that you designated the resources. You didn't just list them, but you had a little star next uh, to those that were good for beginners and and two stars that are better for a more intermediate level. But even then, there are several that you've listed out with either one star or two. Are Is there one or are there just a couple that you would pick for both that beginner level and intermediate level for those listening to this saying, um, I, you know, I think I'm I'm ready for a deep dive on hermeneutics. Where would you send them? It's a good question. Um, it's kind of hard because you're talking to a professor about books and what's your, which ones <laughs> do you recommend. It's like, okay, well, let me go to my library and start pulling out all of them. Um, if I had to boil it down to three, I might say, and this is, uh, you know, this interview is all on the fly, so I wasn't prepared for any of these. Let me think while I'm thinking fast. Yeah. Uh, Roy Zook's basic Bible interpretation is a staple in conservative evangelical Bible colleges and seminaries for a reason. Um, it's, it's still, it's, it's very well done. We still assign it at our school for the undergraduates, um, in Bible interpretation and, and elementary hermeneutics. So that's a it, really, it's a bit know. like a, a peanut butter sandwich on whole wheat bread. It's, <laughs> it's pretty good for you and it tastes all right, but boy, it's dry. dry. It's dry. <laughs> that's, that's an excellent way to put it. It is, uh, exactly. It, unless you're absolute, like exclusively nerdy, it, it's not gonna, it's not very gripping. It's, yeah, it's almost like if the Bible came with an instruction manual, that's what that's, it would look like. <laughs> right. That's right. It, it's very helpful, but it doesn't keep your attention. Like if you're looking, it doesn't, it doesn't really wow you, but it gets to the nuts and bolts, right? Yeah. Um, as I'm thinking, one even before then, that is very helpful for even a church crowd, a lay level crowd, is Howard Hendricks living by the book. Because um, that one you're going to get, it's more of engaging popular level writing. And so the basic steps of observation, interpretation, application, he does a very good, um, you know, very teases that out in practical ways and makes it engaging for the everyday reader that's not an academic. Those two books are good. Um, moving past that, um, there's, um, oh, I have it in there. I should pull out uh, uh, my book because I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on the name, which is killing me because later, but like, how did I, how'd you forget that? Um, I'm thinking of... Uh, 
oh, why can't I think of his name? Robert, uh, Robert, Robert Stein. That's what it is. His um, entry level uh, biblical interpretations book. I can't remember the exact name of it. It's been through several printings. A, a basic uh, guide to interpreting the Bible. That's it right there. Very good as well. These are more uh, elementary levels to get you into actual hermeneutical theory. Going into the more immediate, intermediate, uh, also on that one, because Ken and I were talking about this earlier, uh, Inductive Bible Study by Richard Fuhrer and Andres Kostenberger is also a very good one to go. Um, and on that, I get made fun of a lot of this because I use a lot of Kostenberger works. He was a mentor of mine in my PhD studies, and, and we've been friends for many years. So I, I'm, I'm privy to a lot of things that Andreas Kostenberger writes. His book, uh, Invitation of Biblical Interpretation exploring the hermeneutical triad of history, literature, and theology. It's a beast. You know, the, the second edition is like 800 pages, I think, 900 pages, whatever mm -hmm. it is. But it's very, very thorough. It's very good of applying historical context, literary context, and finally theological context. That's the hermeneutical triad I talk about in, our book, in my book. Um, that would be one more at an intermediate to advanced level. Outside of that, you can get into exegesis, dealing with the actual Greek and Hebrew. There's some excellent works by D.A. Carson and others that deal with that. Um, interpretation of the New Testament is a favorite of mine because I'm a New Testament professor by like Daryl Bach and some other uh, uh, some other scholars from, from Dallas Seminary were, were part of that. Um, uh, yeah, Wallace, Wallace was one of them that was in that has a good, good, um, good essay. Anyways. I can be going on and on and on about this. This is, why I put, this is why I put it, Jeremy, at the end of the book, so I don't have to be asked about it. No. <laughs> but those are some those are some some basic resources, perhaps, to start with and to go into more of a deep dive. Now, I want to ask you one. This is our last question. Um, you know, in many ways, you know, this book is is kind of geared towards individuals and trying to help them see the need, the process, and get kind of get their feet wet and get started in in their journey towards biblical literacy. Want to ask a question about okay, maybe there's a church leader, or maybe there's just a father who wants to help his children grow in biblical literacy. What kinds of advice, or maybe uh, encouragements, or strategies could you help us think through as leaders, pastors, elders, fathers uh, that can help spur other people on towards biblical literacy? Other than hey, just here, just read this book, right? Yeah, yeah, no, good question. Um, a couple things actually come to mind. And I think I addressed this in the book. I'm not too sure. If I didn't, I should have. <laughs> Maybe a little bit the next edition, but I think I do. Um, first, let's start with the very basic. To understand that father, that pastor, whoever is, that leader should know without a doubt that the Bible can and should be understood. Hmm. Um, that it is not this mystical um, you know, very fragmented, odd, you know, you know, oddity that's just floating around the world that we call the Bible. There's an actual intent to it. God revealed himself. We call it the written revelation of God. So the very fact that it's revealed is the opposite of concealed, right? It, it's meant to be understood. So if that, if that leader starts with that belief, this, that all my people, whether it's my family or the church that I'm leading can and should understand that that should be number one, two, as I, I think I do get into this in the book, actually, I think about it. Um, most important outside of that, um, which would probably be actually on top of that, um, you need to be a believer in Jesus Christ, right? So you have to have the, the the faith in Christ who opens the eyes to the scriptures, as we see that in the end of Luke. He did that with the disciples, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. He opened their minds to understand the scripture. There has to be a divine enablement at some point for you to really understand and submit to scripture. So you need to be a Christian. You need to be regenerate, have the Holy Spirit in you to be able to read these things as it's intended to be. Three, very simply, they need to be prayerful. You know, my, my wife and I have gotten in the habit of that. We'll say before we read scripture, look up to God in prayer before we look down to his word to read, <laughs> right? So whether you're leading your church or your family, we're going to pray first before we start trifling with God's word. We're going to pray that we understand this rightly for him to open up our, open our minds. So these are more, you know, these are more existential, if you will, more character driven rather than skill set, but they're all very, very important. And uh, humility is another one be humble that I'm not going to come to the scriptures with my own interpretation already set. You know, now the more seasoned you get, you're already assuming certain interpretations that comes with being seasoned more developed in your, in your biblical literacy. But if I'm leading first time believers or a family or, or a very brand, a new church with perhaps novice or immature Christians, I'm going to say we cannot come to scripture with a pre understanding of certain conclusions. 
we have to let the text speak for itself. And that, that is human. That speaks to humility. Um, we're not going to get angry if the scripture speaks against our belief that we came into with, we have to do our best to, to, to set aside our presuppositions as best we can, which is almost impossible, but to at least set them aside and let the scripture speak for itself. So holding on to those things, a, a correct belief that scripture is God's revealed word and it can and should be understood that it can be understood rightly by only by the Christian who's, who is indwelt by the Spirit, who is praying before for, for understanding before, perhaps, during, maybe even after reading, and um, and coming to the scriptures humil- with humble with a humble attitude. Those things are gonna put you on the right track um, to be able to to grow in your biblical literacy and to lead others to become biblical literate. Well, the book is a primer on biblical literacy by Corey Marsh, PhD, scholar in residence. Professor of New Testament at Southern California Seminary. Thanks for coming on and talking about the book with us today. Hey, I appreciate you guys. And again, appreciate the podcast. Thank you for having me on.